resource center is mandated to supplement, complement, and coordinate all learning assistance programs within the university to ensure that the goal of promoting academic excellence will be realized in a more caring and nurturing environment. We have several programs at the Learning Resource Center that caters to the need of various students, stakeholders, and faculty and staff in the university. One of which would be tutorials. We also have uh, training programs. We have the uh, RPVD, what we call the recruitment of the best and brightest. We also have Excel, the Agricultural Rural Development uh, Scholarship or Arts. We also have the Bridge Program and Play or Providing Learning Alternative Space. At the center, students could take advantage of our uh, free computer uh, services to please they could surf in the center. They could also uh, print a few pages of their uh, paper requirements. We also have some books and uh, manuals that they could take advantage of, especially in uh, math subjects and chemistry subjects and some natural science subjects. In conducting the programs, we partner with the student organizations, especially with the tutorials and Excel, and some faculty members. We also partner with OIL, the Office of International Linkages, in conducting Excel. That is exchange, students, challenges, experience, and lessons learned. We also partner with other colleges in conducting our tutorials, especially in courses like mathematics, physics, chemistry, and some biology courses like uh, genetics, the difficult courses. In the next few months, we're trying to come up with uh, video materials on uh, specific topics that a faculty member may be able to discuss, and these topics can be uh, use as a reviewer or a planning setting for faculty members who will be teaching a particular subject. For those who need the tutorial programs, uh, customized training programs, please come to the Learning Resource Center and we will be happy to help you come up in addressing a particular need of your organization.
math subjects and chemistry subjects and some natural science subjects. In conducting the programs, we partner with the student organizations, especially with tutorials and Excel, and some faculty members. We also partner with OIL, the Office of International Linkages, in conducting Excel. That is exchange, students, challenges, experience, and lessons learned a lot. We also partner with other colleges in conducting our tutorials, especially in courses like mathematics, physics, chemistry, and some biology courses like uh, genetics, the difficult courses. In the next few months, we're trying to come up with uh, video materials on uh, specific topics that a faculty member will be able to discuss. And these topics can be uh, used as a reviewer or a planning setting for faculty members who will be teaching a particular subject. For those who need the tutorial programs, uh, customized training programs, please come to the Learning Resource Center and we will be happy to help you come up in addressing a particular need of your organization. Hi, good morning everyone. We'll start in a few. First, good morning to all our viewers from FB Live. Sir Jesus Gamayan, good morning. To Ms. Ria Peralta de la Cruz, good morning. Watching from San Jose del Monte, Bulacan. Ms. Gina Bonifacio Madin from Santa Rosa, Laguna, Francis Noel Alarcon. Uh, Eliazor Navasca, Educator from Cavite, Benedict Omedina from uh, Batanga State University, good morning, sir. From Milben Humamil, good morning. From Dario Manata from Santa Tomas City, Batangas, good morning. Miss Myra Domingo from Laguna, good morning. So, good morning, every, everyone, and to also good morning to all of our viewers from Zoom. From Ma'am Loinda Valdrias, good morning, ma'am. Ms. Belinda Lalap, good morning. Mary Jean Volato, good morning. Ma'am Esther Sangalang, good morning. And to the rest of our viewers in Zoom. We have already 281 participants in our Zoom link. While for our FB Live, we have 149 viewers. So good morning, everyone. In the meantime, here are just a few reminders to ensure the smooth uh, flow of the meeting. First, uh, please mute your microphones during the webinar to avoid distracting the speaker and your fellow participants. And keep your comments helpful and considerate to the speaker, moderators, and to your fellow participants. Third, uh, the questions, your questions will be entertained by, by our speaker after the webinar through the question and answer function. So since we have a handful of attendees, we will just be selecting questions. And those questions with the most number of likes, we will be selecting them. So for example, if you are joining us through Zoom, just type in your question in the Q&A function. And if you see that the questions are just the same with a question in your mind, then no need to comment them, but kindly like the question or mark it with a thumbs up. And those questions with many likes will be chosen uh, later on. And then for our FB attendees, we will be selecting or screening few questions too. So feel free to comment or send in your queries. Fourth, you may take notes during the webinar, but rest assured that the session will be recorded via Facebook Live 
and kindly check our FB page for the live streaming, fb.com slash UPLBLRC, or you can just search for our page, UPLB Learning Resource Center. And do not forget, guys, to answer the evaluation form right after the seminar to secure your certificates. Good. All right, once again, good morning, everyone. Hi, welcome to our first uh, webinar. My name is Cheryl Ed Hermosa Ebron, the University Extension Associate II and Training Coordinator of the UPLB Learning Resource Center. So on behalf of hashtag Team LRC and our director, Dr. Benjamin Apola G. Floor, welcome to the LRC's first webinar series entitled Making Sense of Data, a practical guide in analyzing and presenting your findings. And this is our first session on data visualization, fundamentals and best practices. I will also serve as our session's moderator today. So to start with our session, allow me to introduce our resource speaker. He is an assistant professor at the Institute of Stati Statistics of the College of Art and Sciences of the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Los Banos, sorry. He finished his Bachelor of Science degree in statistics and Master of Science degree in statistics as well with the Cognit in Information Technology in UP Los Banos. As an instructor in statistics, he is teaching several undergraduate course in statistics ranging from st statistical theory to statistical methods. In 2016, he was awarded as the 2016 UPLB Outstanding Teacher for the Physical Sciences Junior Faculty category he was also given the 2019-2021 One UP Faculty Grant Award in Statistics for Outstanding Teaching and Public Service in UP Los Baños. Our speaker has served as a technical consultant for several institutions such as uh, Philippine Statistical Research and Training Institute, Manila International Airport Authority, Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, or TESDA, Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Study and Research in Agriculture, or CIRCA, and Strategic Research and Development Center Incorporated, or Strand Asia. He has also delivered several training programs to various agencies on topics such as data visualization, infographic design, building computer assisted personal interview use systems using CS Pro, web page development, data management, and analysis using MS Excel gender statistics and analysis, and statistics and probability for senior high school uh, teachers. Our resource speaker for today's session, please welcome the very young and very charming Professor John Lorenzo Ayambot. Sir, take it away. Thank you, Ma'am Cheryl. Uh, can you hear me? Is my audio clear? Yes, sir. All right. All right, so good morning, everyone. On behalf of the UPLB Learning Resource Center, I would like to thank everyone for showing your interest and enthusiasm in this webinar series entitled Making Sense of Data. I understand that some of you woke up earlier for this webinar, but I also understand that some of you may have a disrupted sleeping pattern because of this community quarantine. But anyway, welcome to the first part of this webinar series, and the topic is on data visualization, principles, and best practices. Uh, I'd just like to share a little bit of trivia. Among all the topics that I usually deliver for government and private institutions, I would consider this topic as, the, as my most favorite topic because I love seeing the eureka or aha moments of my participants every time I would share the principles and best practices of data visualization. 
But since we are in a different situation right now, I guess I would just take time to read your feedbacks that I would be getting from this webinar. So for this uh, webinar, we'll be covering four main topics. The first topic is on the brief history of data visualization. We'll simply check how our visual representations have changed over time. Second main topic is on the importance of data visualization. We will answer the question, how does data visualization make data more understandable? Third main topic is on choosing the right chart type. So I will basically introduce or reintroduce to you the chart types that are commonly used for several goals, such as comparison and ranking, trends over time, part to whole, correlation, and geographical data. And the fourth and the last main topic is on ethics of data visualization, wherein we'll look at practical and real life applications of data visualization. Now, before I begin the first topic, uh, let me just check if my participants or if all participants are alert and attentive. So uh, I will flash another slide and you need to go to, yeah, you need to go to menti.com and uh, upon going to menti.com, you will type the code 939923 as flashed on the screen, and you will simply select the answer to this question. So which emoji best represents your mood when you woke up this morning? So perhaps I'll give you one to two minutes to answer this question. So let's see how is the mood of our participants. And so I suppose um, a lot of our participants are feeling happy this morning. Okay, let's just wait till we reach, I think, around 300 responses. So six more, two more. All right. So you can still uh, key in your answers, but uh, as we have a quick glance on this uh, output from menti.com, I can see that relatively a lot more participants are feeling happy this morning, but there are around... Uh, 78 participants who are still sleepy. <laughs> I understand, okay? So baka po, uh, baka po hindi pa ito ang usual na gising ninyo sa umaga. But anyway, aside from me checking your mood today or checking if the participants are alert and attentive, I also chose this uh, icebreaker because what is flashed on your screen is an example of data visualization. I think you would agree. And at a quick glance, I think in a matter of three to five seconds, we're able to quickly understand the message of our data. Just like what I did earlier, in a matter of three to five seconds, I was able to capture the message that majority of my participants today are feeling happy. All right, thank you for participating in our icebreaker. All right, so going back to the presentation, so for our learning objectives, at the end of this webinar, you must be able to discuss the importance of data visualization, identify what type of data visualization is most appropriate to use, considering the data and the goal. Third is to define cognitive load and clutter. And the last one is to discuss the role of ethics in data visualization. Let's have this quote by American baseball player and coach Yogi Berra, and he once said, you can observe a lot by just watching. Do you agree with this statement? Well, I think so. He is so right in saying that you can see a lot by just observing. In fact, this is what data visualization is all about. It's about taking a whole bunch of text and numbers and transforming them into a format that can be easily understood and processed by our brain. So for our first topic, we'll discuss the brief history of data visualization. 
So visual representations are fundamental concepts of human understanding. In fact, humans have used visual representations even during the early times. And even up to now, hindi na po tayo lalayo. Uh, the example that I used earlier or the icebreaker that I used earlier makes use of images to communicate. The emojis, di ba? We do not need to send a message to a person by typing, I am very happy today. You just simply need to send a smiling emoji to express the feeling or to express your mood for that certain time. But anyway, if we are to study the importance of data visualization, we must first take a step back and appreciate how our visual representations of data have changed over time. So let's have this example. This is a wall drawing that was found in Turkey. And it has been said that this nine foot wall drawing has been there for around 6,200 BC. Uh, let's check. What do you think is being represented by this nine foot wall drawing? Well, for me, I think this nine foot wall drawing is simply a map. It shows a map of a certain community. But don't you worry, even up to now, the intent of the drawing is still unclear. But most people, like me, okay, use the same uh, interpretation that this wall drawing looks like a map. For our second example, let us consider this map of the 1854 London cholera outbreak by Dr. John Snow. But before, uh, before that, okay, wag po kayo mag -alala. This is not the Dr. John Snow of Game of Thrones, okay? So he is the Dr. John Snow who is considered as the founder of modern epidemiology. But anyway, during the mid of 19th century, London cholera or London suffered from a series of cholera outbreaks. And during that time, the prevailing belief was that cholera is viral. It is spread through a miasma in the air. So Dr. John Snow theorized that cholera is spread through contaminated water. So he would like to contradict that prevailing belief that cholera is viral. So what Dr. John Snow did is he focused on a certain community with a high incidence of cholera and he plotted the individual cases into a map. Now, zooming in to a specific portion of this map, let us just uh, uh, contextualize the images that you can see in this map. Now, please note that the black rectangles represent the individual cases of cholera. And we have here a water pump that is found in Broad Street. Now, by visual inspection, you will observe that majority of the cholera cases were found near the water pump. And further analysis of the data shows that the outlying cases, let's shift to a laser pointer, this. So we have this outlying cases. Okay? You will notice that or uh, it was found that these outlying cases have water connections that, that can be traced to the water pump in Broad Street. So upon seeing these observations, Dr. John Snow removed the handle in, the, in this contaminated water pump and few days after the cholera cases subsided. So this is a very popular example of how data visualization works. So in this case, Dr. John Snow used data visualization as one of the supporting evidences to contradict a prevailing belief. And this is a good example because it shows that data visualizations can be both data-driven and actionable. Data-driven because it is built around a certain experience and actionable because it influences decisions. So we saw from our previous examples how the power of visualization can answer questions and even work for the public good. This time, I would like to share some reasons why data visualization is important. First reason is our brain is wired for visual perception. Second reason, our eyes jump straight to images. And third reason, visualization uncovers data characteristics. So let's discuss each reasons one by one. First, our brain is wired for visual perception. Here are some statistics. 
Did you know that 90% of the information transmitted to the brain is visual? And 65% of the population are visual learners. You agree with this? Well, I think so. Because people tend to learn and remember information more accurately using visuals than compared to tuning into information using audio and text alone. And another statistic that we can see in this slide is that the brain processes visual information 60,000 times faster than text. And I'll just give a very relatable example for this. Imagine that I will give you today a sheet of paper, and in that sheet of paper, there is a graph and the text below it. So it's a sheet of paper with a graph and the text below it. Now, where do you think where your eyes will most likely land? So I think the first thing that your eyes will notice is the graph, right? So it is for this reason that we process visual information faster than text. But if you are not yet convinced with these statistics, let's consider more examples. So we have here the total population by administrative region in the Philippines as of the 2015 Census of Population and Housing conducted by the Philippine Statistics Authority. Now let's have this very simple game can you name the top five most populous regions in the Philippines? Starting with the top one down to the top five. I'll just give you around five seconds. Game. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. We're able to name the top five regions. Okay. Now, I'm sure your experience is that the top three most, popular, most populous regions were very easy to name. So the top three most populous regions are Calabarzon, NCR, and Central Luzon. And for our eyes, it was very easy to spot because of their number of digits. But when we came to the top four and the top five most populous regions, it required us to inspect each and every row of this table. So that's the case if we are looking in a table. But what if we transform this table into a graph. And we go back to the same question, name the top five regions with the highest population count as of 2015. In an instant, you can easily answer this question. So the top five most populous regions are Calabarzon, followed by NCR, followed by Central Zone, then Central Visayas, and then Bicol region. So very easy, right? Because I have said a while ago, we are visual learners. We process visual information faster than text. Now, second reason, our eyes jump straight to images. Did you know that 70% of all our sensory receptors are in our eyes? And if we look at this infographic, I think all of us would agree all, or most, if not all of us, would agree that we felt happy by seeing this infographic. Maybe because of the smiling face, and maybe because the color yellow is dominant in this infographic. Well, in fact, the image and the color helped in processing the message of the data or processing the message of this infographic. Because this infographic is about the happiness index of ASEAN plus countries in 2016. So perhaps another reason why we need to seek the help of, of uh, visuals in presenting our data is that visualization grabs our attention, especially in this era of data overload and short attention span, we really need to come up with a material that catches the attention of our intended readers or intended audience. Third and final reason, Data visualization uncovers the characteristics of your data. Let's look at this very cool example. So all of these 12 data sets have the same X and Y means, standard deviations, and the same correlation coefficients. Except for the third up to the last decimal place. Well, despite this statistical similarity, in these 12 data sets, as we can see from the visualization, 
these 12 data sets are very different in terms of their structures. So here's a very important reminder. Take note that summary statistics give, uh, provide a quick glance of your data set. It provides a cursory glance of the data set that you are working on. It is data visualization that uncovers the richness and the detail that you can found in a certain data. In our next example, I would like to share. In our next example, I would like to share this video by Dr. Hans Rosling, who is a physician and statistician whose researches are mainly focused on health and economics. So he starred in this video entitled 200 Countries, 200 Years in 4 Minutes. And this is a very good example of how data visualization uncovers potential relationships. So let's watch this video. Visualization is right at the heart. Can you hear it now? Part of my own work too. I teach global health. All right, sorry. Kolampo pala hindi nakakarin. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before. Animating the data in real space. With a bit of technical assistance from the crew. So, here we go. First, an axis for health, life expectancy, from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth, income per person, 400, 4,000, and $40,000. So, down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble show the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. 
in my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou, it is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you have seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? All right. So very nice po. Ano? So in fact, this uh, data visualization was tagged as the as the greatest visualization that you will see in your lifetime. All right. So uh, we move on. So our previous examples show how the shapes, colors, and patterns that we see in our visualizations help us to internalize the message of our data. So for our next topic, we will shift our gears and try to improve the skill sets that we currently have in our data visualization. So first question that I would like you to ask yourself is, how do I usually know if it's the right chart type? How do I know if out of this data characteristics and structure that I have, this is the right chart type to answer my goal or to answer the question that I have in mind? Well, in MS Excel, it isn't a difficult task because Excel considers the structure and the formatting of your data, and Excel already recommends an appropriate chart type based on your data. But I'm sure you will agree that sometimes Excel doesn't do it right. Now, what if we now have this hypothetical situation of you having your data it's already validated, it's already clean, and you are ready to visualize your data. Question is, how do you know if what chart type should you use? At an instant, do you know that it is the bar chart? It is an area chart, it is a pie chart, it is a line chart that you should create? Or do you decide based on this question, what do I want to show? And I think this should be the basis for your decision. You should aim to answer the question, what do I want to show? Just like in research writing, you must have a goal in mind. So why do you want to create this chart in the first place? So there are actually a lot of thought suggestions for choosing the right chart type, such as this one. In this chart suggestion thought starter, you would observe that it starts with a question of what do you like to show? Do you want to show comparison? Do you want to show distribution, composition, or relationship? And once you have an answer to this question, you now select the chart type based on the nature and the characteristics of your data. So the bottom line is always start with questions. It has been said that the single most important step in data visualization is trying to know what you would like to say. With the amount of data available today, 
it is very easy that you can mislead somebody with a line chart, with a bubble chart, or with a scatter plot. So it is very important that your data visualization has a purpose. And you should be selective in including what information you would include in your data visualization so that you would answer the objective or the goal of your data visualization. So now, let's proceed with discussing the common chart types based on their goals. So we have the first one. For the first, uh, for the first goal, we have comparison and ranking. And we have here the bar chart. And obviously, the bar chart is used to represent quantitative values with the length of the bars, which makes the comparison of values easier. Bar chart is considered as the most versatile chart type because it is used for qualitative variables and for quantitative variables that have been categorized. So it's as if that it is a very obvious choice for a chart type in which you would like to compare and rank values. So what are the best practices? First, best practice is start the y-axis at zero. So this is one of the most common mistakes people do in bar graphs. Remember that we perceive the differences or the heights in the, dif the differences in the heights of the bars to be proportional with its size. So remember that you can easily mislead a person by starting your bar graph with a y-axis value not at zero. So let's consider this example. And di na po tayo lalayo sa situation natin. So for example, let us consider that the data set being visualized in these two examples are the number of COVID-19 related deaths in three locations. Now, let's focus first on the, let's focus first on this bar graph. So by visual inspection, by near visual inspection, you would notice that there is no reason to panic or there is no reason to worry about location A because the number of deaths associated with location A is relatively fewer as compared to location B. And the highest COVID-related number of deaths can be found in location C. So what if you're the decision maker? and you just relied on this bar chart, and you just relied on the height of the bars without looking at this y-axis values. So at an instant, mali na yung decision, or pwedeng mali na yung decision na magagawa mo. So if we do it the right way, if we start the y-axis value at zero, you will notice that there are very small differences in terms of the data values for these three locations. So remember, always start your y-axis value at zero. Second, space bars appropriately. The recommendation is that the spaces in between bars is one half of the bar width. The guiding principle in here is that you would like to maximize the space allotted for your data. So as you can see from this bar graph on the left, okay, there are a lot of spaces in between the bars and sometimes it is not aesthetically pleasing. So you would want your bar graph to look elegant and pleasing to the eyes of your audience. Now, don't panic. You don't need to do this manually in MS Excel because as you can recall, this is the default of MS Excel, right? So there is a lot of space in between bars. Now in MS Excel, you can set the spaces in between bars to one half of the bar width by just going to the formatting of your data series. So suppose you already have this bar graph in MS Excel. So you click the bars, right click the bars, and then select the option Format Data Series. And when you select this option, a window pane or a pop-up window will show up on your screen, and you need to find the option Gap Width. The default of MS Excel is 219%. You simply need to change it to 50%. So doing this will have the spaces in between bars to 50%. All right, so next best practice, arrange the bars according to magnitude whenever necessary. Remember that your goal in doing a bar chart is that you want to compare and to rank values. And arranging the bars according to their magnitude 
will help us in comparing and ranking the data values much easier. So it will be easier for our eyes to know that this category has the largest magnitude, followed by this category, and so on and so forth. But please do remember that arranging the bars according to magnitude should be done if necessary. So there are certain instances wherein you do not, you do not want to disrupt or to, di uh, to uh, change the arrangement of the categories in your bar graph. A very good example is presenting responses using a Likert scale. So for example, yung very satisfied, satisfied, neutral, dissatisfied, and very dissatisfied. You, do, you would not rearrange the bars according to their magnitude because your brain and your eyes expects that the high satisfaction ratings can be found on either ends of the graph. And the low satisfaction ratings can be found on the opposite end. And the neutral rating can be found in the middle. So in those cases, you should not rearrange the bars according to magnitude. All right? Next best practice, do not overdo the colors of the bars. Now in data visualization theory, it has been said that adding more colors to your data visualization causes your brain to do more work. And adding more colors to the bars of your bar graph brings a lot of work to your audience or to your readers. And also remember that most of the time, the data values represented in a bar graph simply belong to the same category or to the same data set. So since they belong to the same data set or to the same category, you should just use a single color to represent them. So the only time that you will use a different color in your bar graph is that if you are representing another data set or another category, or if you would like to highlight a certain data point. Now, in terms of the formatting or the orientation of your bar chart, there are actually a lot of suggestions on when to use a vertical bar chart and when to use a horizontal bar chart. Now, traditionally, Vertical bar charts are said to be best used when you are comparing values in a time series data. But please don't get confused, okay? We are still talking about the bar chart, except that we are now applying it to a time series data in which the magnitude is more important rather than the movement of the time series. In another sense, horizontal bar charts are said to be best used when you are presenting categorical data with long labels. Now, I have a very relatable example for this. Have you tried doing a bar chart, specifically a horizontal bar chart, using categories with long labels? Can you still recall how MS Excel places the labels in your bar chart? So isn't it that the labels are either placed 45 degrees or worse, they are placed 90 degrees. So if you're the reader, there are two options for you, available for you to read the graph. It's either you will tilt your head to read the labels or you will tilt the paper or your screen to properly read the labels. So that is why if you have categories with long labels, I would advise you to use horizontal bar charts because by doing so, you would just uh, present the categories in their natural way of reading. Next goal is showing data values under trends over time. And the most obvious choice for this one is the line chart. And we all know that the line chart gives a quick view of the trend and other characteristics of our time series data. We also can look at multiple data sets in a line chart by simply viewing or looking at multiple lines in a single chart. And please take note that if you intend to use the line chart, the ultimate goal is to emphasize the movement of the points in a time series. What are the best practices? First, include a zero baseline if possible. So that best practice is still present in the line chart, but this time, there is a clause that says, if 
possible. Why? Because there are certain data sets in which the relatively small fluctuations or relatively small differences are more important for them. For example, data from the stock markets. Okay? Market shares usually exhibit very small variations. And if you start your baseline at zero, it will just simply look like a straight line. But for people analyzing financial data, that straight line actually doesn't generate much important insights for them. So to exhibit these variances or these variations, you can start the baseline at a value not necessarily equal to zero. But in other cases, please always remember, you should start your baseline at zero value. Next best practice, spacing of the time series units must remain constant. Guiding principle, do not misinform your audience. Just like in the bar graph, people always notice the shapes or the lines rather than the axis labels. Okay? In this case, you will notice that maybe there is not much difference between the two line graphs or between the two uh, situations. But what if, okay, but what if there is a very uh, significant difference in other time series data that you are considering? So take note, guide, another guiding principle is do not compare apples with oranges. So if you are comparing yearly data, make sure that you are consistent. You should start point one with year one, point two with year two, point three with year three, and so on and so forth. Okay? If you have distances in between, also make sure they are consistent. If it would be a two-year difference, make sure it is consistent from time point one up to the last time point. Next, if the curves do not overlap, you may label the lines directly. Now, sometimes using multiple colors in your line chart is not advisable, especially if you will reproduce it in black and white. So to solve this potential problem, okay, and to solve the problem of you looking at a line and then referring back to the legend, looking at the, at the second line, going back to the legend, and so on and so forth, if the curves or the lines do not overlap, you may label the lines directly, such as the example on the right side. Now, sadly, this customization is not yet available in MS Excel. So that, that simple trick is that you just need to insert a text box at the end of the lines in your line graph. Next best practice, maintain a two to three or three to four height to width ratio. So this only means that you should plot your data such that the line graph is approximately two thirds to three fourths of the way up to the, ver up to the vertical axis maximum height, such as this one. So once again, the two to three or three to four height to width ratio means that the height of the maximum or the highest point in your line graph should occupy approximately two thirds or three fourths of the entire line graph. And also remember, that using excessive spaces in your line graph might alter or might change the actual trend that is reflected in your data. Third goal, we have part to whole comparisons and the most obvious choice that we have is the pie chart. So perhaps among all chart types, I think this is the chart type that we are commonly using. But since it is the most commonly used chart type, it is also the most misused chart type. But before we go into that detail, take note that pie chart is best used when the proportion or percentage is more important for you as compared to the actual raw values. And it is also applicable if you have your data sorted into categories for a specific period of time. Now, some best practices. First, visualize no more than five categories. Remember, you are creating a pie chart and not a color wheel. Okay? Now, other people would say 
that if I have more than five categories, I would just compress the six down to the last category into the others category. But remember, that is not always the case for all types of data. Okay? Hindi po lahat ng data kaya yung gawa ng others category. Next, best practice. Order the slices correctly. The recommendation is place the largest slice in the 12 o'clock position, then arrange the order in a clockwise manner. So as you can see on the pie chart on the right, this is the largest slice, which is placed in the 12 o'clock position. The second one, the third largest, fourth largest, and the smallest, si smallest slice that is arranged in a clockwise manner. Don't worry. You don't need to do this manually in MS Excel, like rotating your pie chart over and over again. So you simply need to sort your data from highest to lowest in MS Excel and then let Excel do its job. So once again, if you, intend, if you really intend to use a pie chart, you need to first arrange your data set in decreasing order and then you are now ready to create your pie chart. So automatically, Excel will graph your pie chart in which the largest slice is in the 12 o'clock position and then the remaining slices in order in a clockwise manner. Third best practice, and I'm sure some are guilty, make sure all slice sizes add up to 100%. Remember, pie chart is used for making part to whole comparisons. So the pie chart represents a whole. So it should really sum up to 100%. So the only instance wherein we usually commit this mistake is if we are rounding off certain values in your data set. So sometimes it's okay if we can add one decimal place, two decimal place, but personally, I think if you add more than two decimal places in your data labels in a pie chart, that is already too much. That is already too much for our eyes and for our brain to process. I'm sure there are other alternatives to pie chart, which I will show later on. Fourth one is do not use multiple pie charts for comparison. Would you agree that it is hard for us to compare areas in a pie chart? Like for example, without the presence of the data labels, can you exactly or accurately tell me the percentage associated with these blue slices in these two pie charts? So the common uh, technique that people do when using pie charts is that they just put data labels to aid in the comparison and in the ranking of data values. But please take note that if you have several of them, sometimes it would take a longer time for our brain to process the message of our data. Okay? Now, if you're not yet convinced, let's have another example. So this shows the number of COVID-19 cases by age group in the Philippines as of yesterday. Okay. Now, I'll give you a matter of uh, seconds to appreciate this graph. Okay. Water break na lang din po muna ako. All right, so we have very nice wall clocks here. And joke lang. So we have very nice um, multiple pie charts here. Okay, It shows the number of patients who are currently admitted, recovered, and deceased uh, from COVID-19. And it shows eight age groups from 11 to 20 years up to 81 to 90 years. Now, at a quick glance, it is very easy to say that uh, a large proportion of patients aged 81 to 90 years 
died due to COVID-19. Would you agree? And fewer patients aged 21 to 30 years died due to COVID-19. But what about the percentage of recovery? Can you exactly tell me which age group has the highest percentage of recovery? Which age group has the smallest percentage of recovery? Now, in this series of pie charts, it may be difficult to exactly tell. Because as you can notice, the green slices are placed very differently across these eight pie charts. So if we visualize it in another way, such as using a stack bar chart, so let us recall that a stack bar chart is simply a variation of the bar chart, wherein each bar is simply divided into several segments, such that a single bar would represent a category of a certain group. So going back to our previous example, and visualizing the number of COVID-19 cases by age group in terms of this stack bar chart. Now, it is very, again, easy to note that a large percentage of patients aged 81 to 90 years died because of COVID-19, while a smaller proportion of patients aged 21 to 30 years died because of COVID-19. And if you go back to our question a while ago, we can see that middle-aged uh, people uh, have high recovery rates as compared to those aged 11 to 20 years and those aged 81 to 90 years. Now, you might ask me this question, sir, I think this is not the best way to present this data. I would agree because this only shows the percentages. It does not show exactly how many people are infected or how many people have are admitted, recovered, or deceased from COVID-19. So we can use another variation of the bar chart or, or of the stack bar chart, which uses the raw data values. So remember, at the end of the day, we always go back to your goal. If you go back to the previous slide, your goal here is to quickly show which age group has the highest and the lowest recovery rate or percentage of deceased patients or percentage of admitted patients. While in this stack bar chart, you are hitting two birds with one stone. Because aside from knowing the percentages, you can also know which age group has the highest and the lowest number of total cases. So I would just like to share with you this study that says or that investigates how our brain processes relative magnitude. So there is really a psychological evidence on why we are not recommending to use multiple pie charts for comparison. Now, if you look at this image, take note that humans are very poor in processing information expressed in volumes. While we are very accurately interpreting information that are expressed in positions. Now, if you look at the elements present in a pie chart, such as the curvature, the area, and the tilt, take note that they are placed very, very relatively lower on the scale. So it is again for this reason that we do not recommend comparing multiple pie charts. And the last example, if you are not yet still convinced on why you should not use a pie chart, Let's have another example still related to COVID-19, but this time let's consider the cities and municipality in the national capital region. So these are the number of COVID-19 cases in NCR as of June 29, 2020. And as you can see, Quezon City has the highest number of cases and Pateros has the lowest number of cases. But if we go back to our discussion a while ago, I said that you do not use more than five categories in a pie chart. And if you notice that in this pie chart, there are a lot of eye movements going on. So you will look at this slice. Oops, this is green color. What is the, what is the city represented by this color? 
This is a blue color, go back to the legend, yellow color, go back to the legend, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of things going on. And you do not want that certain task or that additional task to be passed on to your readers. So instead of visualizing this data in a pie chart, you can use a bar chart to visualize that same data. Now you might ask why this arrangement? So I arranged these categories based on the congressional districts of the National Capital Region. So first district is Manila, followed by second district, third district, and fourth district. But if this arrangement doesn't matter to you, so you can just arrange them according to magnitude. So in this case, it is now very easy to spot. Quezon City has the highest number of cases. And the number of cases in, in Manila City is the second ranking, third is on Makati, and so on and so forth. So since we are now looking at lengths of a bar, it would now be easier to make comparisons. Like how much is the number of COVID cases in Makati as compared to Quezon? How much is the number of COVID cases in Pasig as compared to Pateros? And so on and so forth. Now, if you're feeling extra, okay, there's actually another uh, very nice way on how you can visualize this. You can visualize it using a map because there is another set of insights that can be gained when you visualize this information using a map. So once again, we go back to my reminder a while ago. What do I want to show? So for the several examples and the several situations that I presented a while ago, I would like to leave this message. Resist the use of pie charts. As you have seen a while ago, pie charts are not recommended when presenting too many categories. There are many colors in a pie chart, which means there are many or additional work that is passed on to your brain and to your eyes. And as we have seen in our previous examples, comparing multiple pie charts are hard. And sharing with you a quote from data visualization expert Stephen Few, pies are not for data visualization. Save the pies for dessert. So as you can see in this meme, okay, the only time that you will use a pie chart is to show the ratio of the pie that you have eaten versus the, the pie that you are about to eat. Okay, so moving on to the next goal. What if I want to show the correlation or the relationships in my data? And the most obvious choice that we have is the scatter plot. And the scatter plot is ideal for showing clusters, patterns, and relationships in our data. If you're feeling extra, you can visualize more than two quantitative variables by using a 3D scatter plot. Now, what are some of the best practices? Now, if you intend to show a trend, kindly use trend lines in your scatter plot, but limit them up to two trend lines. So in other words, if you wish to visualize more than two data sets in a single scatter plot, just stop there, okay? You do not want to visualize more than two data sets in your scatter plot because sometimes the trends or the relationships might be very difficult to spot or to inspect. Now, the concept of trend is actually a, a, a statistical concept. So if you are not familiar with it, I will just uh, advise you not to use trend lines because what if you are asked, what does this trend line mean? Why is the point or why are the points very distant from the line? So yung paggamit po ng trend lines is another statistical concept that you should be familiar with. And the last best practice, which I think is the very useful one, use quadrants or dividers when appropriate. So I happened to stumble upon an example of the use of quadrants or dividers in a scatter plot when I was collaborating a certain research with a colleague. So in most agencies, I'm sure those watching who are from government agencies or NGOs usually conduct satisfaction studies, right? So one way to measure your performance is by 
considering an important satisfaction or important performance metrics, such as this one. So for context purposes, uh, this is simply referring to ratings. So importance ratings, then the x-axis are performance ratings. And it focuses on several aspects or several, uh, uh, do you call this? Several categories in your service delivery. For example, in this scatter plot, there is participation, training, planning, promotion, fitness, appearance, and so on. Now, dividing your scatter plot into quadrants or dividers actually helps you to discover the patterns or to discover certain insights about your data set. Because, for example, if we are to focus on this quadrant, let's label this as quadrant number one, which refers to the categories or the aspects with high performance rating and high importance rating. Would you agree? So this quadrant has high performance rating and high importance rating. If I am the stakeholder, if I am the decision maker, I would tell to myself, well, I should keep up the good work in this aspect. Fitness, appearance, mentoring, and parents. Let's move on to the second quadrant. The second quadrant reflects values with low performance rating and high importance rating. So it's as if you are saying that these aspects are very important for our customers, but we are performing very poorly. So an insight would be, we want to focus on this aspect. Can you now get uh, the additional insight that we can obtain from using quadrants or dividers? And the third quadrant, which reflects low performance rating and low importance rating. So it's as if that we are saying that these aspects are not important for our customers or for our stakeholders. So we should just put this in low priority. And the last quadrant, High performance rating, but very low importance rating. So you are performing very good in these aspects, but it is relatively uh, not much important for your customers or for your stakeholders. So you have to take your focus off the meantime for these aspects because there is a possibility that you are overkilling the delivery of your service in terms of this aspects. So see? So this is just one example of using quadrants or dividers in a scatter plot, which I think is very useful in this situation. So maybe you would like to share instances or situations in which the division of a scatter plot into quadrants or dividers are very helpful in the data that you are presenting. Now, another chart type that you can use when you want to show correlation or relationships is a bubble chart. And the bubble chart is the chart type that you saw in the video a while ago by Hans Rosley. So the bubble chart is used to visualize a data set with two to four dimensions. And what are these four dimensions? The first two dimensions are the actual numerical values. It's as if that you are just plotting the points in a scatter plot. Now, if we go back to our example a while ago, the 200 countries, 200 years in four minutes video, the first two dimensions of our bubble chart are the life expectancy and the income per person. So these are the actual numerical values that are visualized in the X and the Y axis. Third dimension is that you would modify the size of the bubbles. So you add another dimension to represent a certain category, which means if it is a larger bubble, it's a larger value. If it is a smaller bubble, it is a smaller value. In our video example a while ago, the third dimension is, what, can you guess? The third dimension is the average population size. So we saw in that video, that countries with large bubbles have large population size. Countries with small bubbles have small population size. 
And the last dimension is that you can vary the colors of the bubbles according to another variable or according to another category. In our video example, the fourth dimension is the continents, right? The Asian countries were represented in a different color. The African countries were uh, denoted in a different color. Same is true for the American and the European countries. So ito, feeling extra, syempre, because there is an animation for the bubble chart. But yung bubble chart, pwede rin naman po siyang static. Okay? So it can just be plotted on a single chart. Okay? But I think you would need advanced visualization tools for you to plot a moving bubble chart. But the good news is the newest version of MS Excel can enable you to plot a bubble chart. Okay? Pero wag po masyado mag-expect, static bubble chart lang po. Okay? So once again, if you want to experiment on the bubble chart, and if you have the newest version of MS Excel, I think it's Microsoft Excel 365. I'm not sure if versions like 2010 have the bubble chart option for the charts type, but the newest version of MS Excel already has this bubble chart option in the chart type. All right, and we now go to the last chart type, which is the maps. And we obviously show this if we want to plot geographical data. And I already saw in the comment section a while ago that uh, the example of Dr. John Snow's London cholera outbreak map is, of course, a classic example of how you conduct spatial or geographic analysis. And in these times, it is very helpful if you can create thematic maps because you're able to show similarities or differences across certain places which are adjacent or contingent with each other. Now, I have just have a single best practice for using thematic maps. If you have quantitative data having positive values, I would recommend you to use a color scheme that uses at most two color hues that would range from light to dark. In other words, don't use too much colors. Limit your color choices up to two. And that two colors would just range from light to dark depending on the magnitude of your data. So for example, I got this thematic map from the website of the Philippine Statistics Authority, which shows the small area estimates of poverty incidents in 2015. Now, as you can see, let me zoom in to a specific portion of this map. Okay? As you can see, the designer of this thematic map shows the green color to denote low poverty incidence rate and a red color to denote high poverty incidence rate. Then that green color would just range from dark to light and that red color would just range from dark to light. And by doing so, it is very easy to spot which area in the country has the lowest poverty incidence and which area in the country has the highest poverty incidence. So imagine if you use multiple colors, the interpretation and the understanding of the information, regard, especially regarding to the magnitude, would be very hard. It would take a lot of time for you to process the information that is presented in a thematic map. So to aid your readers in the easier interpretation, you can follow this best practice. So. That's it for choosing the right chart type. So you saw how the points, shapes, uh, patterns in our graph actually convey insights. And ano ba dapat yung titignan natin whenever we are creating a certain chart type. But before we move on to this main, to this last main topic, please bear in mind that the things that I presented a while ago, I labeled them as best practice. I did not call them as rules. Precisely because they are not written in stones. Okay, It's not as if that if you do not follow them, you're ultimately wrong. Because you, if you come to think of it, bakit yung MS Excel ginagawa yun? Tama? Bakit yung option na yun available sa MS Excel? It's just that I chose to label them as best practice 
Because if you follow them, then there is a lower risk or lower instance that you can distort the information that you are trying to say. There is a lower possibility that you will misinform your audience. And most importantly, there's a higher possibility that you will create an effective chart. All right? So let us now go to the fourth main topic, which is on the ethics of data visualization. And I'd like to introduce this topic with another icebreaker. Let me check if my participants are still tuning in to my talk. All right, so let's have this very simple icebreaker and you will again need to go to menti.com but this time, we'll use a different code, okay? 20857. So once again, go to menti.com and use the code 20857. So we have here a tilted, exploded 3D pie chart, okay? I labeled specific categories in this pie chart. And these are categories A and B. Now, compare the two slices. How much is category A different from category B? So your choices are, it will reflect in menti.com, okay? Choices are A is the same as B. A is 1.5 times larger than B. A is 2.5 times or 2 times larger than B and A is 2.5 times larger than B. Okay, yan yung choices. Tingnan natin. So for those who would like to inspect again the pie chart, so here it is. So compare category A with category B. Okay, so let's just wait for 500 responses. <clears throat> Okay, five, four more responses. Three. All right, so it seems that uh, majority of our participants think that category A is 1.5 times larger than B, uh, followed by 97 participants who think that A is same with B. And 46 participants think that A is two times larger than B, while only three participants think that A is 2.5 times larger than B. Now, here's the situation. Imagine if this, if that certain pie chart is on a on an infographic, 
in a website or in a newspaper kung tayo pa nga lang po hindi tayo nag-agree doon sa percentage difference ng dalawang categories, paano pa yung intended audience or paano pa yung intended reader natin? Okay? So, let's reveal the answer. So, the, this quick brain exercise uh, lets you to compare category A and category B. Now, what is the problem with this pie chart? First, it's 3D. Second, it's exploded. Third, it's tilted. So, we will discuss these issues later on. And by this very quick brain exercise, I think you will uh, suddenly have that aha moment about certain issues about using 3D and exploded pie chart. Pero umami na po yung umamin, okay? Baka minsan nakagawa na tayo ng ganito, okay? Perhaps some of us are feeling guilty now. But anyway, if we uh, recreate this 3D pie chart in a 2D pie chart, you will notice that category A is two times larger than category B. So most of you got this exercise wrong. Okay? So see? Very simple pie chart, 3D pie chart, but there are a lot of interpretations going on. So this is the main issue that we, are, that we will talk about in the last topic of this webinar, ethics of data visualization. And computer scientist Ben Schneiderman once said, the purpose of visualization is insight not pictures. Remember that your job as the data visualization designer is to turn your data from numbers or from the tables into a format that, you, that is clear and meaningful in the minds of your audiences. And how do you do that? How do you make your material clear and meaningful to the minds of your audience? First thing, you should be aware of how our brain processes visual information. If you're already aware of the strengths and limitations of our visual perception, then the better your designs will become. So let's define two terms that we will encounter as we go along in this topic, and these are cognitive load and clutter. Cognitive load is simply the amount of mental effort required to interpret information, while clutter as what we know from our layman's understanding is simply the elements that can be removed while still preserving key ideas. So in other words, yung layman's term understanding natin ng clutter, di ba po ay kalat. So in data visualization, clutter is synonymous with junks. Okay? And the guiding principle here is that reducing clutter means minimizing cognitive and what is our goal in data visualization? It is to minimize cognitive load, yet accurately communicating the message of our data. So how do you do it? How do you reduce clutter and minimize cognitive load? First, avoid chart junks. Chart junk, as I have said a while ago, simply refers to clutters. Okay? These are the elements that are not necessary to comprehend the information represented on the graph. In other words, chart junks do not carry additional information. Chart junks are distractions. An example of a graph with a chart junk is the one that you can see on your screen. Now, this graph, I just did it in a matter of 10 seconds in MS Excel because if you are familiar with MS Excel, di ba po mayroon siyang option for quick designs, right? Wherein you can instantly turn your 2D graph into a 3D graph. Then you can put shadows, you can put a different background color and so on and so forth. Now, let's go back to this principle. Do you need these elements? Particularly, in our example, do you need this shadow? Does this shadow carry additional information? 
do you need to turn your graph into 3Ds? Does a 3D graph carry additional information? Do you need a gradient colored background? Does it carry additional information? You already have an axis label, then you have a data label. Do you need both? Okay. Isn't it that we are already presenting redundant information? So in this case, ang guiding principle natin is that if I remove this element, do I retain the same amount of information? If yes, then that element is considered as a chart jump. But please don't get me wrong. I am not saying that you should... Uh, go back to a black and white chart that you should go back to a very simple chart. While you should remove the chart junks in your graph, please always remember that you should all, you can also still make your chart look elegant and pleasing. And there are multiple ways on how you can do this. One is use an interesting color, right? Use a good color combination. And there are actually a lot of online resources in which uh, it will help you to decide which color combination you can use. Okay? Sideline ko or I, uh, side comment ko na lang din po. Please avoid using the default color of MS Excel, yung blue plus orange, okay? yung light blue plus light orange, because they are not uh, uh, good color combinations. So if you have extra time, please have the extra time to change the colors of the default colors in MS Excel. So instead, you can use a darker color blue and pair it with another color depending on the nature of your data. But anyway, we'll be talking about colors later on. Now, there are common chart junks that are usually committed in several graphs. The first one is optical art. And as you can see from this illustration, it is the abuse and misuse of patterns and lines in our graph. The problem here is that the abuse of patterns creates a psychological tremor in our eyes. It's as if that the graph is moving, the lines in the graph is moving, and it is very uncomfortable for our readers. And you do not want that experience to happen to your readers. Second, yes, grids are jumps. But I am not saying remove the grids. Message here is that mute the grids. As much as possible, you would want the grids to not compete with your data. It should not compete with the shapes and with the lines and the points of your graph. So a technique would be use lighter colors, use thinner lines. If you do not need secondary grid lines, remove them. Okay? So part naman na to, very good the MS Excel. Because if you will notice, MS Excel uses thinner lines and gray lines for their grid lines. Always remember, grid lines are guides. They should not compete with your data. And the last chart jump that we have is the duck. Oh, you might wonder, sir, that's not a chart. Yes, I know, it's not a chart. In fact, it's a building in New York, and it is called the Big Duck. This building is known to sell duck and duck eggs, and it is very popular in New York because of its unusual appearance. And what does this duck do with data visualization? Well, in data visualization, sometimes we commit the duck as the chart junk if we tend to over-decorate our charts. Similar with the duck, Baka po unusual na yung appearance ng graph natin. Okay? In this graph, we see that patterns, lines, and colors have overtaken a very simple bar graph. There are unnecessary elements. And let's go back to the question, do you need these elements? Do they carry additional information? Okay, next on reducing clutter and minimizing cognitive load is saying no to 3D charts. I think you already captured this message when we had our quick brain exercise a while ago. I hope you realize that 3D charts offer no additional information. And in the instance or in the case of our quick brain exercise a while ago, 
there is really a high chance that 3D charts can mislead your intended audience. Now, sadly, even up to now, I can still see data visualizations such as this 3D charts. Okay? Para po sa akin, hindi yan bar chart. Para nga siyang buildings sa tagig. Yan. It's as if that I'm looking at several buildings in Metro Manila. Okay? So, if you will notice, walang information, walang insights tayong masyado nakukuha from these 3D charts. Instead, it only confuses our understanding of the data. Okay? So, say no to 3D charts. So, in reducing clutter and minimizing cognitive load, the godfather of data visualization, Edward Tufte, has this guiding principle. Above all else, show the data. Sounds weird, right? Isn't it that if I'm doing a bar graph, I am showing the magnitudes. If I am doing a line graph, or if I am constructing a line graph, I am showing the trend. If I am constructing a scatter plot, I am showing the relationships in my data set. But what do you think does Edward Tufte exactly mean in saying, above all else, show the data? So Edward Tufte was trying to point that we should always value our data over the design. As I have mentioned a while ago, sometimes we tend to over-decorate our charts. That we come to a point that we are already misleading, distorting, and misinterpreting the potential information that our data would like to say. So always remember, when doing charts, show the data above all else. Okay, so this would be the last part of my talk. And let's have this very quick uh, exercise in which I gathered several charts that I found in the internet. And let us give some constructive comments on these charts. Okay? Now, for privacy purposes, okay, tinanggal ko na po kung saan ang galing yung chart na ito. Baka pumabash ako. But anyway, I'm presenting this example so that you can also learn. Okay? So there is this reality that people tend to create these charts that they alter or distort the information that they are trying to say. Okay? So let's have this first one. This is a pie chart showing the top causes of stress for Filipinos. Okay, I think I'll give you around... I think I'll give you around 30 seconds to inspect what is wrong with this pie chart. Now, I'm already seeing several uh, comments in the chat box of Zoom. One is misleading color scheme. More than five categories. Yes, very good. Because as you have said a while ago, for pie charts, limit your categories up to five slices. Then, someone also said that it is not sorted. Yes, good. Okay. Uh, what else? What if... Shift your focus to this slice, job or studies, which says it's 22.85%. Can you tell me what's wrong with this slice? Yes, Mr. Lawrence Alterado. Yes, it does not up, add up to 100%. Then um, Rage Nel Valencia, not representative of the percentage. Yes, very good. It is more than 25%. When in fact, it says here that it is 
the visualization or the representation of this data value is already more than a quarter. It's more than 25%. So how come the 22.85% yung data value? Okay? So if you will improve this, perhaps in our previous example, we can just show it using a bar graph. Right? We can quickly uh, discover or spot in a bar graph which category is the ha has the highest contribution to stress for Filipinos. But before doing that, okay, I would recommend to check the computations because obviously the percentages do not sum up to 100%. Okay, nice try. Very good. All right, so next one. Okay. So this is a very controversial waterfall chart from or from the internet. In fact, I shared a post in Facebook discussing about suggestions and what is wrong about this chart. So if you have, if you have already read it, or I'm sure there are a lot of uh, comments and suggestions about this one. First thing is that the length of the bars does not match with the x-axis scale. You will notice this bar says it's 2,285, but it's uh, reflected somewhere between 1,500 to 2,000, right? Another one is here. It says it's 837, but it doesn't reach the 500 mark in the x, sorry, in the x-axis. And another one is that the highest value, 5,812, is way uh, pass through the values on the x-axis scale. So my recommendation here is that make sure that your x-axis scale always includes the maximum value. In this case, the, da the data visualization designer should include an x-axis maximum value up to 6,000 perhaps to accommodate this largest value. And Another thing is that I would not recommend you to use pink colors for female and blue colors for male, okay? Because uh, in, uh, uh, in practice, that is not gender sensitive, okay? So we should avoid using or associating pink colors for females and blue colors for males. All right, so next example. This one, Singapore, let's entertain insights from the chat group of Zoom. Okay, what do you think is wrong with this line chart? The data being presented here is the number of murder and homicide cases reported. That's from 2010 up to 2016. And the uh, actual data values are represented in the table below. Can you spot the mistake in this chart? Yes. Uh, there are duplicate information. It is visually overloaded. What else? Focus on the x-axis label. Okay, very good, Mr. Glenn Fabia. The time units. Uh, recall in our discussion that in line chart, please take note that you should be consistent with your time series points. You should not distort the scales. In this case, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, consistent pa, tama pa. But when we came to the last two time series points, suddenly there are two points for 2016. But if we look at the table below, apparently the two time series points for 2016 reflects the January to June period and the July 1 to August 3 period. So obviously there is a selective uh, information that is being presented in this line chart. So take note, guiding principle, don't connect yearly or monthly data or quarterly data in a single graph. Make sure you are consistent. If you want to present yearly data, present that 
all throughout your line chart. Don't compare apples with oranges. If you will ask me how will I improve this chart, I will just simply remove the 2016. I will just plot data points from 2010 up to 2015. And if I want to focus on the number of murder and homicide cases in 2016, I will just display them in numbers. There is no need to include them in a line chart because in the first place, it is not consistent with the other time series points. And, you know, aside from the chart junks that we can see from this chart, okay? Pero yung uh, major mistake here is the time series points. Okay, very good. Next one. This data shows the Philippine economy's bright spot in tourism, specifically the tourism revenue, which is claimed to have increased by 109% from 2010 to 2011 up to 2016 to 2017. What do you think is uh, problematic with this bar graph? Let's see from our Zoom chat. Yes, there is something wrong with the x-axis. Can you exactly pinpoint what is wrong with the x-axis? Okay, very uh, nice input, ma'am Opulencia, five-year break, then connect. Yes, there is an interval, more than half of the bar size. There are missing years. You're correct, Mr. Paulo Sanchez. Yes, so there is no data from 2012 to 2015. And actually... There is something wrong with this, okay? This practice or mispractice in data visualization is what we call as cherry picking. If you will notice, the designer carefully selected specific time series points to exclude the impact or to exclude the potential contribution of certain points in the presentation of our data. If you will notice, the designer cherry-picked the years 2010 to 2011 and 2016 to 2017 to show that there is a 109% increase in the tourism revenue. Okay? I would not give further comments on this, okay? but I would just like to show here that the major issue that we have here is cherry-picking. So if you would ask me how would I improve this chart, of course, you should show all relevant time series points. I am sure there is data from 2012 up to 2015. All right. Next one. We have here a very interesting map okay, that shows the regional allocation of PPEs across several regions in the Philippines. Can you tell me what is potentially wrong with this chart? Yes, there are too many colors. Very good. So, natuto tayo dun sa best practices natin kanina. Take note, this chart uses too many colors. And in fact, the colors do not help in the interpretation of the quantitative information. Okay? It's as if that the map in this infographic is simply a decoration. It does not tell you the distribution of PPEs across regions in the Philippines. So ang maganda dito, nalaman mo lang na ito pala yung NCR, ito pala yung CAR, ito pala yung Region 1, and so on and so forth. But I would always tell my participants in data visualization this principle. If you have the opportunity to use visuals or to use images to represent your data, take it, maximize it. So in this case, since I have already a map and I'm using colors to represent it, I will use this map to show the distribution of PPEs across regions. So as I have mentioned a while ago, tip, you can use at most two colors that would range from light to dark. So in this way, may additional insight. 
I would instantly know, ah, this region has the highest allocation of PPEs. This region has the lowest allocation of PPEs. And if you are the decision maker, that is something to think about. That is something that you should be happy or that you should worry about. So always take note. Your images, when used in the data visualization, should carry information. They should not act as simply decorations. Okay? So thank you for participating in our chat box. So to conclude my talk, in applying ethics in data visualization, here are five reminders. Number one, start the baseline at zero when necessary, as we have repeatedly seen in our best practices for the different chart types. Two, do not invert axis. Okay? Our human understanding of x-axis value zero is always on the left side, and y-axis value zero is always on the bottom part. Do not invert this axis. Third, do not distort scales, as we have seen in an example of a line chart. Fourth, avoid cherry picking. And number five, make your color choices logical. Always remember that color has a powerful psychological influence in our brain. Color can make or break your design. So as much as possible, since color is a design element, it should still carry information. Okay? Actually, there are a lot of things that we can talk about. We can talk about other visual symbols, about from the usual chart types. We can talk about the contributions of colors in our data visualization. But I think that can be discussed in some further webinar series. Okay? For now, I would just like you to appreciate how we apply the best practices in data visualization. And I hope even with uh, this very short talk, you can now apply these best practices in the future data visualizations that you will construct or you will create. And I would like to leave you with this quote from Randy Olsen. The only thing worse than not visualizing data is visualizing data incorrectly. Poor design can ruin everything that you are trying to say. Remember, data visualization helps us to understand and internalize the message of our data. If we fail in the design of our data visualization, then we fail in the communication of our information. So that's it. Maraming salamat po. And I'm now ready to answer questions from our Facebook Live and from our Zoom Q&A chat. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sir Enzo. So before we proceed, Sir, with the question and answer, uh, let us just... Um, wow, thank you so much, Sir Enzo. At first, it is indeed a very informative and helpful discussion on how to communicate data to your audience. So would you agree, guys? Have you learned something new today? Because I did. <laughs> I learned so many things today. So thank you so much, Sir Enzo. Before we proceed with the Q&A, we would like to take this opportunity to thank our resource speaker. So may we also acknowledge our director of UPLB Learning Resource Center, Dr. Benjamin Apology Floor, to give the e-certificate of appreciation and our token of appreciation to our resource speaker for this morning. So uh, ma'am, let me just read first the citation. So the University of the Philippines Los Baños Learning Resource Center present this certificate of appreciation to John Lorenzo A. Yambot for serving as resource speaker in the first session on data visualization, fundamentals and best practices in the webinar series entitled Making Sense of Data, a practical guide in managing, analyzing and visualizing research findings held on July 1st, 2020. Given this first day of July 2020 at UPLB Learning Resource Center, UPLB College, Laguna. Signed, our director, Benjamin Apology Floor. Thank you, Sir Enzo. Thank you, Paul. For this very <laughs> wonderful uh, presentation. And our token, a virtual token. <laughs> yeah. Favorite mo, <laughs> Sir Enzo. Favorite mo, Sir. <laughs> Ibang iba na po talaga ngayon. Send you the real one after uh, <laughs> M-A-G M-M <laughs> G, G, Q, C. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so may we now proceed with the uh, question and answer? Yes, ma'am. So 
We have 16 questions sa Q&A po natin for the Q&A function. And we also have a few questions from the Facebook Live. So let's first uh, read the questions here in the Zoom Zoom, um, yeah, the Zoom question and answer uh, portion. So first, we have a question from Vladimir Amatorio. Is there a difference between what you want to show versus what the data wants to show? <clears throat> All right. Uh, uh, definitely, there is a difference between what do you want to show and what the data wants to show. Okay, but in data visualization design, I think you should strike a balance between the two. Okay, because if you just keep on subscribing to what you want to show, maybe there is a possibility that you will just cherry pick or that you will just carefully select information that you will present in your graph. So if your data shows that this is the actual trend, then present it. Okay, if your data presents this kind of magnitude, then proceed with it. So there's really a difference between the two. So just strike a balance between the two questions in uh, designing your data visualization. All right. So I hope that answers your question, Sir Vladimir. Next, we have from an anonymous attendee, for data with very high first value, is it possible to put a break on the y-axis in MS Excel between zero and the first value? Um, honestly, I have not explored uh, the function of Excel that uses a break because in the first place, I do not do it. <laughs> okay? I do not usually I do not usually put breaks in in a graph again basically because as I have mentioned a while ago, do not distort your scales. Now I understand that there are some data sets that might have this problem. Say for example, it would have 10 categories in a bar graph, Nine categories would have same values, then the other category would have a very high value. Now, I would uh, tell my participants usually that if this is the case, maybe the bar graph is not the best choice for presenting your data. Maybe you would just, uh, it, maybe it would be better if you would just present it in a table. Okay. So always go back to the question of whether I am uh, clearly understanding the information that I am trying to say. That's it. All right. Thank you, Sir Enzo. Another question from Vladimir Amatorio again. Can you recommend any book or online resources for data visualization? Uh, there are a lot of uh, online resources for data visualization, uh, even blogs. Okay? You can just uh, search through the internet. There are several blogs about data visualization. In fact, some blogs talk about uh, problematic charts, and they discuss what is wrong with Sorry, what is wrong with the chart and how they can improve the chart. But in terms of books, I would recommend the book by Edward Tufte. Okay? It's entitled The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. Uh, let me share my screen. There. So The Visual Display of Quantitative Information by Edward Tufte. It's a very good... Uh, it's a very good reference for data visualization because the basic principles are here. The chart junks, the cognitive load that I am discussing a while ago are in this book. And as I've mentioned, there are a lot of blogs that you can read for uh, data visualization principles and best practices. All right. Thank you so much, Sir Enzo. Another one from an anonymous attendee. Where can I learn more about scatter plots? For scatter plots, I think there are again a lot of online resources that you can uh, check for making scatter plots. Just make sure that if you want or if you intend to construct a scatter plot, first is they have quantitative data, okay? Because obviously you cannot construct a scatter plot if you have qualitative data. So if you have a pair of quantitative data and you aim to show their relationship, then you can construct a scatter plot. Okay, another question, sir. Thank you so much. How to use uh, quadrants or dividers? Po? Is there a specific way on how you put it in your graph or do you just divide it into four? Also, can it be divided into more than four parts? Let's say six. All right. So in dividing your quadrants, it, de it depends on your practice. It depends on your research field or on your field of study. 
because sometimes they would select they would uh, think that on a scale this is the neutral part or this is the zero part in fact i nakita ko po ito sa uh, sa isang dashboard related to covid-19 i think it's the dashboard created by the UPLB biomathematics team yung sa job risk classification so may scatter may bubble chart sila doon then yung bubble chart nila divided into several quadrants pero yung pagdivide nila ng quadrant is based on the average risk classification rate so there is really no single rule on dividing your quadrant hindi siya laging sa zero ng x sa zero ng y or sa middle ng x sa middle ng y it depends on your field of study and then if it can be divided into more than four parts honestly i haven't seen a bubble chart or a scatter plot that has more than four quadrants. Thank you, sir. Another question. How can we deal with outliers in a data set? How can we write about them in the discussion section of a paper from an anonymous, an anonymous attendee? Um, this one. Yeah. How can we deal with outliers in a data set? How can we write about them in the discussion? All right. Always remember, viewpoint of a statistician, always treat outliers with caution. You do not simply delete the outliers in your data set. Okay? In fact, if there's an outlier in your data set, you need to describe it. You need to discuss it in your paper. Okay? And uh, again, it would vary for several fields of study. Some researchers would opt to uh, carefully delete these outliers while some researchers would not advise to delete these outliers. Because again, these outliers carry potential information. And these outliers are very helpful when you are still on the exploratory stage of your data analysis. Another question, sir. Can you please, hi, can you please conduct data visualization workshop? Thanks. <laughs> nice question. <laughs> Sasagutin ko po ba? <laughs> yes po. <laughs> Okay, done. Another one, sir, from... Uh, wait lang, Ma'am Shelly. Oh, sir. Okay, Actually, go. share ko lang po. In, in the usual trainings that I conduct about data visualization, may workshop po ito wherein I ask my uh, uh, participants to review the charts that they created some time ago. Okay, maybe in their report, in their PowerPoint presentation, and check whether they... Uh, they followed the best practices in chart design. And very interestingly, nakikita natin na talagang na-amaze sila na dapat ganito pala yung ginawa nila, dapat ganon. So I would advise you to also do that. So at the end of this webinar, maybe you can go back to the charts that you previously created, perhaps in your thesis or in your special problem or in your PowerPoint presentations, <laughs> and check if you can still improve your charts. Ilan po. Sorry, Ma'am Sheryl. Can proceed on. Thank you so much for answer for answering mm. that question. Another one from an anonymous attendee. May I know, sir, what PowerPoint software you used for this presentation? Very nice po. You can zoom on the slides. PowerPoint lang po. MS PowerPoint. <laughs> Pwede po siyang i-zoom. Explore niyo po. Meron pong uh, option sa baba o kaya pwede naman pong control tas scroll up. Okay, po, sir. Thank you so much, po. Let me just um, ask this question, sir, from Mamiet, our very own Mamiet. I'm teaching a research me methods course in an agricultural uh, in agricultural economics. Can I use this presentation as part of my online lecture materials? No worries, ma'am. Okay, lang po, Mamiet. <laughs> in okay. fact, I also uh, deliver the same uh, webinar or sorry seminar or training for Ovicre. Yung sa uh, implementation po ng mga basic research. So I share this material so that they can still uh, go back to these best practices when they are designing their charts. No problem po, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Next question from Christian Lubert Milambiling. Sir, how about best practices for doing and comparing box plots and error bars? Uh-huh. For box plots and error bars, I think it would uh, still follow the same principles like avoiding chart junks. But honestly, I haven't uh, stumbled upon some issues regarding box plots. So because, again, uh, 
ang potential issue na lang or problem natin with comparing box plots if there are several of them. Like for example, you are comparing 20 box plots. Okay? If you are comparing already more than uh, what your brain can process, maybe magiging potential source ng problem na siya. So always go back to the question of can I still understand the information that I'm trying to say. But aside from the usuals, check mo yung y-axis label mo, consistent ba siya, nag-start ka ba sa zero baseline, it should still follow. Okay, thank you, sir. Next, um, from an anonymous attendee, sir, are you saying that I shouldn't clear the label of bar chart if there's label in the y-axis already? Aha, parang medyo malabo po sa akin ang tanong na ito. Clear the label of bar chart. Ah, I see. Yung sa data labels saka sa y-axis labels. Okay? Now, this is actually a common issue, but here's my take on this. Okay? Using y-axis labels and data labels is already redundant. Okay? In practice, you use y-axis labels if you want to emphasize the magnitude or the trend. Okay? If that is more important for you. While you use data labels, if you wish to emphasize or to focus on the actual data values. Okay? Like for example, you would want your viewer to know that for this category, this is the corresponding magnitude. For this category, this is the corresponding magnitude, and so on and so forth. And at the same time, you can use both, but using only data labels for selected time points or for selected points in your graph. Like for example, in a series of line chart, you would just put data labels in a specific time range because you would want to highlight certain uh, information about this time range. Okay? But then again, that's just my personal point because again, if you have already your data labels for all categories and a y-axis label, to me, that is already a redundant display of information. Okay, thank you, sir. Another one from an anonymous attendee. Sir, how do we manage the style guides of theses slash manuscripts slash co-faculty, which you are very strict in data chart elements, which makes papers too cluttered with their requirements? Are rules different in formal writing? Hey, I'm not surprised to be asked this question because even in government agencies and private institutions, I would always receive this question. Sir, sinunod ka namin, ginawa namin yung gina sinabi nyo po. Pero nung binigay po namin sa boss namin, pinabalik po nila sa dati. So, o kaya yung question na, sir, hindi po kasi ganyan yung sa amin. Hindi po namin practice na uh, i-change yung y-axis labels and so on and so forth. My take on this is that there should be a style guide. Okay? And I believe in formal writing, in journal articles, there are also rules in... Uh, in creating or designing your charts, okay? At the end of the day, again, kung ano man yung rules na yan, kung ano man yung style guide na yan, always watch out for the possibility that you are distorting or misrepresenting your information, okay? Kung hindi naman po na-distort, hindi na misrepresent yung information, then I would be fine with that. You should be fine with that. All right, next question. Well, not a question though from... Miss Lorna, sister, nice sana if in the 200 countries, 200 years, data visualization, real values are used versus normal values. It is it is such a long time series. Maybe nominal values distort analysis as well. Thank you, sir. Learned a lot. Thank you for your insight. <laughs> okay. Next, sir, from an anonymous attendee as well. Hi, sir. Any thoughts on DOH data presentation of COVID-19 cases? Actually, nakita nyo naman na po siguro yung isang comment dyan. And actually, yung iba po mga presentations ko, specifically for the pie chart, uh, ganun po yun sa dashboards. Okay, nirecreate ko na lang din po. Baka kasi ako ay mabash. <laughs> Kapag yung mismong chart yung pinakita ko. But uh, personally, we can still improve on the data presentation. Kasi sabi ko nga po, uh, people are afraid of numbers. 
Okay? Sometimes people are skeptic about numbers. They do not easily trust numbers. So how can we make people trust numbers? We should clearly communicate these numbers. And one way to do it is by using data visualization. Actually, isa pang mas magandang way is by using infographics. Diba? So, singit ko na lang din po itong point na to. If you intend or if you are an infographic designer, of course, you should not you lose all these best practices. Kasi gumawa ka nga ng magandang infographic, maganda yung images mo, maganda yung color combination mo, maganda yung background mo, pero gumamit kang 3D chart, gumamit kang exploded pie chart. Di, nawala din yung potential value na pwede natin makuha from your infographic. Yan po. Thank you, sir. Uh, there are three questions, sir, na pareho lang naman. So, isahin ko na lang po. From Miguel Victor Durian, what are other data visualization software aside from Excel or MS Office? Uh, huh. There are a lot of online resources. Okay. Uh, meron din pong mga softwares like Tableau. Okay. Tableau has a very nice visualization set. Okay. And Google Charts, meron din po. Then when it comes to statistical softwares, Merong R, merong Stata, merong SPSS, okay? Pero yung sa R, madami naman pong mga customizations tayong pwedeng gawin. But I think it would take a lot of experience and skills para din matutunan. And yun nga po, there are a lot of online resources. Kaya din, especially maps. Now, marami na pong online resources for creating maps. Ang limitations nga lang po, halimbawa, in the Philippine context, usually yung online resources hanggang provincial level lang. So if you intend to plot points on the municipal or city level and even up to the uh, barangay level or specific uh, coordinates, kailangan natin ng mga medyo complicated softwares like Geoda. Okay. Thank you, sir. Another question from an anonymous attendee. When to use 3D graphs? I think, ma'am, uh, siguro natanong ito nung wala pa tayo dun sa 3Ds. Pero, kaya na, ma, nasagot naman na po natin siguro yung tanong. Okay pa. How about using a secondary axis? Siguro, ano po to, sir, nung habang nagdi-discuss po kayo? Pero, I think, uh, I think I am, I have no problem with the use of secondary axis. Ang kailangan lang natin tignan dyan is they, uh, axis labels. Kasi, uh, most of the time, people tend to forget to put axis labels. And axis labels are very important because it gives your chart an identity. It gives your chart a context. All right. Thank you, Ms. Alma Lorelei. This is for your question. Another one from an anonymous attendee. Best practices for tables too, please. For tables, um, if you are to be technical about it, Meron po kasi tinatawag na statistical tables which have several parts, okay? But I think your main issue usually sa tables is your table title, okay? Always bear in mind that your table title is the ID of your table. So kung sa tao, yung ID, it's your identity. It's, your, it's the information about yourself. So of course, for tables, your table title should identify the contents of your table. Uh, in fact, meron pa nga pong guideline dito. I'm not sure if I can recall the questions right. There are certain questions that, that need to be answered when constructing or writing a table title. It is what, how classified, when, and where. So if you're able to answer these four questions in your table title, then your table title is already reflective of the contents of your table. All right. Thank you, sir. I think this one is already answered. What are top website app recommendations? So let's move on with the question of Ms. Rowena Noche, how to reduce or present big data in a most simplified illustration. Now, uh, the, for big data, one of the emerging tools for telling stories about our data is the use of dashboards. Okay? And dashboard design and construction takes a lot of experience and skills. To me, I think this is one of the most effective ways of how you can present big data because it is interactive. You can modify how the viewer wants to view and understand the data. But if you have been, or if you have, or if you don't have the sufficient skill set, maybe an infographic would do. 
Okay? Pero then again, infographic designing would require uh, skills and experience. Another one, sir, from an anonymous attendee in relation to, what, to that question about a large first value or access break, what can you say about logarithmic scales? Again, it depends on your research study. Okay? Kasi po yung mga best practices natin would actually vary depending on the field of study. For some researches, okay sa kanila tong logarithmic scale. Uh, careful lang tayo sa interpretation ng uh, data when used in a logarithmic scale. Yun lang po yung potential problem doon. That is why, if you are not the subject matter expert and you are a data visualization designer, it is always important to seek the help of an SME or a subject matter expert because they will be the one to check if you are accurately representing the information contained in your data. All right. Another one, sir. Um, can we have a copy of the book as well along with the presentation? Yung presentation po, yes. Yung book po kasi <laughs> sa hindi po magandang paraan ko siya nadamo. <laughs> So, ibig sabihin po, available naman siya sa internet. Okay, thank you, sir. Another question from Ma'am Gloria Luz Nelson. What are your tips for qualitative data visualization? Hmm, very interesting. Kasi now, aside from bar charts, we can also uh, display data in word clouds, right? Tapos, um, pa ba? word clouds. Uh, for qualitative data, if you want to be scientific about it, syempre, yung mga usual natin, you have your bar charts, your pie charts, okay? Pero since qualitative ito, I just have this simple reminder, may potential lang po kasi na minsan nag over label tayo sa mga qualitative values. Like, exam like for example, sa infographics, bawa may bar chart ka, Tapos yung categories, lalagyan mo ng pictures okay, to represent the name of that certain category. So yung paggamit na po ito ng icons. So always remember, sa icons, dapat relatable sila. Okay? And dapat, hindi siya redundant. Like for example, may icon, label, may icon ka na, tapos may label pa siya sa baba. Okay? It should not carry the same weight. It should not compete with each other. So perhaps, ito yung icon. And then yung label niya sa baba would just be kept at a very small font size and a lighter font color. Then for qualitative data visualization using word clouds, marami na pong online resources for that. In fact, yung ginamit ko pong website, Mentimeter, meron po silang word cloud. Okay, thank you, sir. Next question, there are a lot of data visualization software out there aside from Excel. Can you suggest a specific software for non-stat people like me from an anonymous attendee? I think if uh, you can find the right online websites, I think Excel will do. You just need to conquer that fear from Excel, which I suppose maybe you can conquer when you attend the second part of our webinar series. So to this anonymous attendee, I think pag uh, try mong tignan yung second webinar natin, baka sakali maging friendly na para sa yung MSX. Thank you, sir. So, um, time check, it's already 11.09, right? So, maybe we'll take in a few more questions. Siguro mga five. Five more questions pa po. So, another question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, can you go back to the 3D slides that looks like buildings in Metro Manila? Can you suggest an alternative in, on visualizing that kind of data. All right. Uh -huh. Yeah, this one. So for this one, actually wala po siyang context. Okay? I just uh, presented it. Pero may, pinang, may inspiration po ako dito. Kasi nakakita po ako ng 3D charts, still COVID-related. 
I think yung x-axis niya ay yung locations, say hospitals, tapos ito ay dates. Okay? So again, we go back to our question, what do I want to show? If I want to show the number of cases per hospitals or whatever quantitative value that you have, maybe you can explore using a pie chart, or sorry, using a stacked bar chart, okay? Then yung stacking pattern mo would be yung days, okay? O kaya pwede rin namang both ways. Ang gawin mong stacking pattern, yung, yung categories na nandito sa x-axis, and then yung categories na nandito sa y-axis, pag interchange mo sila. So again, um, it depends on what do you want to show. But I think, in the context of the example we had I think a stock bar chart would be good. Or this uh, also take note that you don't need to compress everything in a single graph. Sometimes you can create several bar charts if you think the data is clearly can be clearly understood if you look at several charts rather than combining all information in a single graph. So don't be afraid to create multiple charts. All right, thank you, sir. This question is from FB Live, sir. Sherwin, from Sherwin Esquilana Magalante Balbuena. What software can be used to create thematic maps? Uh, Geoda and ArcGIS, yung mga medyo complicated softwares natin that needs skills and experience. Pero sabi ko nga po kanina, if you want to create thematic maps, there are a lot of online resources, okay? But if you want to zoom into specific portions or locations, I would suggest Geoda and ArcGIS. Okay. Thank you, sir. Another one from an anonymous attendee as well. How are you able to have a clean data to have a better data visualization? Now, uh, with respect to clean data, madami pong aspects ito eh. For example, if yung data ay galing sa survey, Tatanungin natin ulit yung sarili natin, bakit hindi clean yung data na nakuha natin? Maybe there is a problem with our data collection, there's a problem with our questionnaire. So again, hindi po ito yung tipo na, na we'll just work out with what we have. So if you're the researcher, make sure at the planning stage, alam mo na agad kung anong data item yung kukunin mo. You already know what you want to show, what you want to present, and what you want your intended audience to know. Okay, thank you, sir. Siguro po last uh, one, two, three, four questions na lang po. From Ma'am Maria Shello Lampa, I have seen the video and observed that the data visualized is accompanied by how the message is expressed or the tone and with emphasis on action and, of course, the graphics. Which is the most effective, the visual presentation, the tone, or the body language when conducting presentations? Hmm. Interesting question. Uh, I am not <laughs> a, uh, an expert when it comes to uh, yung communication na gumagamit ng mga tones, bodies. Perhaps our friends from LRC can answer. <laughs> but I would like to think that all are important. Okay? Kasi combination niya ng lahat. An effective visual presentation, a good tone, a good body language would ensure the success of your presentation. Ma'am Cheryl, what do you think? <laughs> Well, we plan it, sir. So, <laughs> depende pa rin po sa audience kung kanina ikaw communicate mm -hmm. yung, um, yung presentation. Yes, yes. All right. Next one. Uh, last three. Princess Marie Adele Mapula. Which chart is best to use in, present, in presentably presenting data with multiple categories of different magnitudes? Say, 15 to 20 categories. Uh, I would think the bar chart is still the best choice that we have now. But you can still try to use other visual models. As I have mentioned a while ago, there are other things that we can discuss about data visualization. In fact, meron pa po tayong tinatawag na other visual models like your uh, pictograph. Ito, medyo familiar sa atin to kasi since elementary tayo, tinuruan tayo kung paano gumawa ng pictograph. Uh, pictograph is a very nice way, especially if you intend to present this information using, a, using an infographic or using in a web page. Maganda to. Then there are other uh, uh, visual models like, I uh, forgot the name. Later po, maalala ko yun. Okay, sir. Thank you um, po. 
Another one. Just curious about your ideas, but what to do if management does not know or understand the best practices for data visualization? Uh, Ham, I think na sagot ko na po yung question na to. If you're in an organization, for example, in a government agency or in a private institution, I would recommend for your group to come up with a style guide. Okay, so it's a handbook containing how you will present all your visualizations, all your communication materials, like what color will we use, what font style will we use in presenting our graphs, what should be uh, our practice, should we cancel out pie charts, should we cancel out 3D charts, and so on. So it involves actually a collaboration of all people in your organization for you to be able to craft a style guide or a guidebook for your communication materials. Okay, thank you so much. Last question po, sir, from Mr. Wena Noche. Ano po kayang patterns of trends ang ginamit ng Meralco to give us a bill for two months na hindi nag reading <laughs> Very interesting question. Very interesting question na hindi ko po alam ang <laughs> sago. <laughs> yeah. Okay po. Meron pa po ba? Okay, for those who are asking po for the copy of the video, it was streamed live po sa FB. So, sa FB page po namin, just search for UPLB Learning Resource Center. Pag nag-end po yung, yung webinar, ma, pwede nyo pong ma-playback yung uh, discussion po ni Sir Enzo. So, meron pa ba dito? Okay. Sir, if they have any more questions, can they still ask you po, sir? Kasi parang madami pa pong natirang mga questions sa sa ating Q&A function. Sure po. And na-remember ko na po yung pangalan ng isang visual model, Icon Matrix Chart. Yan. Try nyo pong i-check yun over the internet. It's also a very interesting way on how you can present your charts or your data. Icon Matrix Chart. Okay po. Sige po. Alright. So, meron pa ba? Okay na. Sige po. Last question na po yun, sir. Okay. And ano pa ba? Sir, um, for the certificates of those who attended the first session, um, isa show po ni Sir Enzo yung link for the evaluation form. Please make sure that you answer the evaluation form um, shown in the link or can be found in, in the link na isa show po ni Sir Enzo to secure your certificates po. After you answer the evaluation form po, the certificates will be sent to your email. Ayan. So pwede niyo pong screenshot and then go to that link. Ganon din po sa mga nasa FB Live. To secure your certificates, please make sure that you answer the, the uh, evaluation form. So that's bit.ly or bit.ly uh, slash LRC feedback form underscore session one. Okay. All right. So maybe to any more. Uh, wait. Wait lang po. All right. So I guess that that's it po for the question and answer. May I again acknowledge our uh, director to close the session, our first session for the Making Sense of Data webinar series. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yambot, for sharing your knowledge and expertise in today's uh, session on data visualization. I hope everyone learned from uh, the presentation, which I did and probably have a better grasp now on how we could improve on our future reports and the basis perhaps. And uh, this session does not end here. So if you want to know how to create the graphs, then you will have to attend next session, which is on Friday, that's July 3, the same time. So again, uh, thank you so much for our uh, participants from uh, Zoom and uh, FB Live. And uh, we hope to see you again on Friday. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ma'am Benj. Thank you, Sir Enzo. Thank, Thank you, you very po. much, Paul. Thank you, Ma'am Benj. Thank you, Ma'am Cheryl. Thank you, Josh. Po. Thank you, po sa LRC. Thank you, Sir John ng ITC. Thank you, po sa lahat ng attendees. Uh, thank you, Sir uh, Director Manaol. Thank you. Yes, po. And shout out sa mga friendships na nanood and Meron po tayong mga participants from the US, from France, and from the UK. So thank you so much for watching. See you on our next webinar. Thank you po and God bless you all. Keep safe.